<laughs> hey, welcome to the Mentor Engineer. I am excited to be here. I've got a laptop, and this laptop is connected through this Ethernet cable to this PLC, which is connected to this HMI, which is connected to this oscilloscope, which is connected to this test track up here with my rolling cart. All right. Now, I'm excited. I made this thing out of dowels and whatnot, some 3D printer parts that I had. All right, but I got a motor here with a gearbox on it. Uh, it's attached to a drum and attached on the other side to an encoder. Now the encoder will tell me exactly where the card is at any point. It will measure the position of that drum. On the big model, it, uh, the actual launch cart will be within 1 16th of an inch. So 16 points would be one inch. And that's about uh, what 1.6 millimeters if my math is correct in the head. So I think that's pretty accurate for what we're trying to do here. So let's see how, Whoa, that reminds me, hey, I need your help. So stick around to the end of this because uh, I do need your help. Uh, but let's talk about our supporters first. The awesome people who pledge their support. We've got Fritz D, Jin, and Ron A. Thank you so much for your support. Uh, hey, it helps the channel, helps me uh, do this project. Appreciate you signing up and being in engineering. So thank you for joining. We appreciate it. And uh, scroll down and uh, click that join button too to help with the effort. Now let's go over here to our computer. And what we're doing is we're measuring the uh, encoder here. That's PV, that's this line up here. And that is right now at 257 points from where the zero point was. Now my set point is this dark blue line in the top graph here. And that's currently at 200. I have it set to go to 200, now it's 257. It's close enough. So the bottom graph here is the output. And that's, uh, it's gonna be two lines. There's an output and a bias. We're gonna be mostly concerned with the output. And what happens is, is I'm gonna give it a command and there's a profile that I have programmed into the PLC and it will output in a number of steps. And I've told it to output these steps in a linear rate and then it'll curve off as it gets towards the top. And that's to ease and the slow down of the, the launch dog so there's not a whole bunch of force on it all at once. It'll also minimize it overshooting its goal and then just going back and forth and back and forth. I don't want to have that happen. So the way that I'm doing it is that profile is outputting a pulse signal and you will see that when I launch this blue line here will spike up uh, a bunch of times and the, the PLC is then calculating how many times it has pulsed and that will be the new set point. So we'll be able to see that when we actually do the launch here. All right, so let's see how that happens. All right, so the motor turned and you can see here on our graph that those two followed each other pretty closely and it overshot a little bit. So the, uh, the light blue line is on top of the set point and at some point it might actually correct that, but it'll be a while. That's called a steady state error. Uh, you can see the output here on the bottom graph went up really high and then it kind of oscillated. We want to get rid of that oscillation in the future. And then it's naturally going down to try to get rid of that steady state. Oh, there it happened. All right, so the next part of this would be to rehome it. And what's gonna happen is it's gonna give a steady output until it gets to the home position, which is that proc sensor down there. So as soon as I hit the button, it'll start unwinding. And then as the cart gets down to zero, there it goes. And I'm gonna move it off there and this will actually do it for me. There it goes. And that'll pull it just off the proc sensor so that we don't get errors with it, thinking that it's in the wrong spot. So we know it's, it was there. Now we just moved it a little bit. Uh, so how does this thing actually work? How do we get it to control the motor the way we want? We want it at a certain set point and we can monitor that with our encoder. All right, so let's say we output, I don't know, five volts to our motor. 
And our motor here is processing this one. It's also considered a plant, and that involves not only the motor, but the gearbox, the drum itself, the inertia of the drum, the inertia of the cart rolling on the track, which does change as we load it and unload it. Uh, so our process is going to vary, and we need to be able to control that smoothly because we don't want to as we're launching, you know. Uh, and we want to measure that output occasionally, uh, very often, actually. So how do we do that? Well, we're going to have a control voltage, like I said, 5 volts in this case, we're going to output. And we're going to monitor that output. And let's say that output is zero. And we feed that back, this little line at the bottom here. And we're going to subtract that from our set point voltage. So if we have zero and we have 200, let's say here, it's going to put 200 in here. And that's our error. That's how much it's off. Now, with a PID controller, there's three components here that determine how fast we uh, change. The first one is proportional. So that is the one we're mostly going to use. The next one is integral. That's the second one in here in the middle. And differential, PID, proportional integral differential. So most of the time, let's just assume we have a proportional control here. We take our error of 200, we output it uh, here. We multiply it by a constant. So in our case, this is eight. And we multiply it and we sum it up with zero and zero, let's say, and they output a control voltage. So uh, 200 times eight is 1600. That's our control voltage. Now it's not actually the voltage, but let's, let's use it here. 1600. So let's assume that our motor doesn't turn at 1600. So we output, we're at zero again, right? Because it didn't turn. Go back up here, 200. 200 minus zero is 200. So 200 here in the error. 200 times eight is 1600. We output and we still get no motion, right? That's what we call a steady state error. And that's bad, especially when we're not even close to reaching our goal. So that's where our integral coefficient comes in. All right, it's going to add to our proportional. And it's going to take the integral of time. So if we had a 200 before and 200 again this time, it's going to say one second has passed. We're going to multiply that by 200, which is the error, times the one second. And then we have a constant here that we're going to multiply by. And we'll just say it's one for our example here. So, all right, we're going to add 200 to it. So now we have 1600 plus 200. That's 1800 now going off. Let's say it didn't move it. So now we come back, zero. All right, 200, 200, we got 1600 up here. Now we have our 200, plus it's gonna say, wait, we had 1800 uh, and it didn't do anything. And we're still at 200 error, so we're gonna add another 200 to it. So now we're at 2000 controlling out. That's our control voltage. And let's say it moves this time, and now the error goes down. All right, so let's say it's 100. So now we got 800 up here, and we still have our integral wound up. So now we're still gonna wind it up, but it's not at a higher rate. So this is why when it makes the big move, and then we wait a long time uh, until it gets rid of that steady state error, this is what's happening. Is this, this term is winding up and winding down. So it can take a long time to do that. The last term here is the differential term. And the differential term says, hey, whoa, 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 we're approaching the set point way too fast. What we now need to do is slow it down. We're going to pump the brakes on it and, and, and wind down everything. Now, the problem with this is it's very sensitive to noisy data. So the noisier your data is, the worse this is going to be for your PID loop. Uh, and you can get sporadic, uncontrollable motion, which we don't want. So a lot of people do eliminate this altogether. I'm getting good results as it is, so I don't see a need for me to have a differential term at this point. So let's look at this one more time and see how it is behaving and how we can possibly make it better. We'll go ahead and launch. Look at this coming up. All right, so I have high gain right there. And then I have a low I factor here. So most of what's happening in the first part is the uh, the K. 
And now we're coming back in about five, six seconds. It's gonna go back just a little bit. Now that's taking a long time, all right? Each one of these divides is five seconds, so five, 10, 15, 20 seconds, 25-ish, or yeah, we're, we're about 25 now. And uh, it still hasn't moved, here it comes. There we go, so it moved back just that little bit. Probably wanna turn that up just a touch. Also, having a defector would allow it to not overshoot as much. All right, let's go back and home it. All right, we can see here that the eye is actually going to take a lot less time to ramp up and get us to our position much faster. All right, that was only like five seconds. So, much better. So... As we get ready to do Tilly's Terror, oh yeah, I forgot about the part I need your help with. We're doing Tilly's Terror. Look at me. We're going to do it. It's going to happen. However, I was talking with my wife and she had a great idea. We were talking about how there's just a lot of risk going to a full-blown Tilly's Terror coaster. And yet we still have this other coaster that's not getting much use. So what we are going to do is we are going to pump the brakes on Tilly's Terror a little bit. Still doing it. What we're going to do is we're going to redesign the coaster we have. And I think this is for the better. The major problem with the coaster we have right now is the launch is at the top. And if we didn't learn anything from the Batman and Robin coaster, it's that you don't put LSNs at the top of the train because they valley and then you can't recover. You got to pull the whole thing back through the layout or disassemble the cars and lift them. Just not a good thing, so we're not going to do that anymore. I hated it because I had to push this big heavy cart over the hill, and we had to have the person get out and then restrap the safety belts and get them back in at the top. It took a long time, and we kind of just got tired of doing it. Take the launch check out, smoosh the hill and the uh, spike together, and on the other end, right between the two outer backed hills, where it goes into the spike again. We're gonna separate that. We're gonna put a curve in to make it fit on my property still. Uh, five sections of launch track and then the spike on the other end. And I think that coaster is gonna be a lot better. So we're gonna take an intermediary step to do this. It'll minimize risk for me. It'll allow me to learn a lot of things at a uh, smaller scale, especially with the PLC and the safety associated with that. So, that's good. Now, where I need your help. Yes, your help. Where I need your help is we need a name for this. So, scroll down right now. Yeah, you scroll. Just, it, it's okay if you don't see my face where you're scrolling. But hit that, uh, that join button. Sign up. Hit that like button. Hit the subscribe button. I can't believe you're not subscribed. Kill me. And then enter a name that I should have for my new coaster in the comments. So I'm going to look forward to hearing all your comments on the name. Do it right now. Don't forget about it. Uh, so I'm going, to talk it over, uh, I'm going to talk over the results of my family. We're going to figure out what name best suits us and this coaster. And then we're going to rename it. And we'll let you know who did it and who was the lucky winner. I'm sure there will be a prize. Don't know what it is yet. There will be a prize. Hey, thanks from the Mentored Engineer. Thanks for watching all the way to the end. We appreciate your comments in the bottom as well. Thank you and have a wonderful afternoon or day or evening, morning, whatever time you're watching this. Thank you.